And your job is, is what Jerry was talking about, Acts 17, the Bereans, to be like the Bereans. <clears throat> Excuse me, to study, to make sure that what I'm telling you is the truth. And also, if it comes to a movie, to uh, you need to, like this movie Jerry was talking about, you need to uh, um, study what is in that movie to know that what they're telling you is the, are the facts because it doesn't always line up with the Word of God. You need to let the Holy Spirit teach you and lead you and guide you into all truth. Uh, last time I, I said to read about the Red Sea, the, how it was divided, and uh, we're going to talk about that. Um, Cecil B. DeMille made the movie The Ten Commandments, and... Uh, he was a Christian, and he was a good man. But if you compare the movie to the Word, and we're going to do that, you'll see that it wasn't very accurate. Uh, I had a friend that I went to Israel with that uh, he likes to blow the shofar, and he's very good at it. He knows the notes that they used. And uh, we were at a Bible study one night, and he said, can anybody tell me who blew the shofar in the Ten Commandments, and the Holy Spirit spoke up in me and said, John Derrick. It was John Derrick that did it, the movie actor. It wasn't Joshua. He was fishing for Joshua, but it wasn't Joshua. It was John Derrick. You can't find it in the Word that Joshua blew the shofar at the crossing of the Red Sea. Uh, like I said, Cecil B. DeMille... He, he was a good man. He was a Christian man. But when you study, to, if you'll turn to Acts or Exodus uh, 14, chapter 14. And, and in the first verse. <clears throat> now, I'm reading New King James Version. I, I don't know... Um, Sometimes it can get a little bit confusing the way the wording is, especially in the King James or the NIV or any of the other uh, versions. Now the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they turn and camp before Thyharoth, between Migdal and the sea opposite Baal as Zephon. Zephon. You shall camp before it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land, and the wilderness has closed in on them. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them, and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled and that the heart of Pharaoh and his servants had turned against the people, and they said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariot and took the people with him. Also he took 600 choice chariots, and all the chariots of the Egyptians with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and took them camping by the sea beside Pharaoh, before Baal of Zephah, and when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Then they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we were told, that told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? 
for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we would die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. <clears throat> and the Lord said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forth, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. So I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army, his chariots, and his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh and the chariots and his horsemen. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. Now, the pillar of cloud represents the Holy Spirit, and it led them, led and guided them in the desert. Now it's going behind them to be a pillar of fire. So it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel, thus the cloud and the darkness to one, and it gave light by night to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Now, the Holy Spirit to one person is a light. To another person is darkness. They don't understand it. <clears throat> it's God's wisdom coming down from above. It's not uh, earthly wisdom. But the, what it represents is the same way as the sun melts wax, but it hardens clay. It hardens mud. So it has, the, the light, the sunlight has a, has a different effect on our hearts. Our hearts are open to it or they're not. And it could be darkness or it could be light. We expect light because he is light and the more we become like him, the more light shines. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night. It blew, the east wind, now in the movie, the sea just parted like this. But here the word of God says that a strong east wind blew all night and drew back the water and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea, all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and the cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that they drove them with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee. From the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. Now they're fleeing the face of God. This is, uh, we'll get into this a little bit uh, further down as far as they weren't crossing the sea to go after the Israelites, they were coming back the other way. They were fleeing the face of God. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea and the waters that they may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. They were fleeing into it. They weren't fleeing away from or pursuing the, uh, the Israelites, they, were, they had already pursued them. They were fleeing back into the, into the sea. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea, 
and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. Now there's a study in there somewhere, the right hand and the left. Christ is the son of the right hand. He's at the right hand of the Father now. There's a study in there, and I haven't gotten to it yet, but it would be something that would be good for anybody. You know, let the Holy Spirit teach you about that. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw a great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Now, I would suggest that you go on and read the song of Moses and, and read the rest of this based on the fact that, you know, if you're, if you're looking at the Ten Commandments, you don't base it on the Ten Commandments. You base it on what the Word of God says. And study... Uh, the Song of Moses, there, there's, there's uh, a lot of prophetic utterances in that song, the same as, as uh, uh, Hannah's prayer in Samuel, which next time, if you make a note of that, we're going to study uh, 1 Samuel. And uh, there, there are prophetic utterances in all of what this song represents, and, it repre and what it represents as far as uh, the Word of God is concerned. And so that's what I'm concerned with is that you have accuracy in the Word of God. You study the Word of God. In other words, like my friend that wanted to blow the shofar, he was, he was totally convinced that, that uh, Joshua was the guy that blew the shofar because he saw it in the movie. Well, you, you got to go by the Word. You can't go by the movie. In the same way with this movie that Jerry was talking about that's coming up, if you have a question in there, if you see something in that movie, go to the Word. Study it. See what the Word says about it. Because you're dealing with men's thinking when it comes to a movie. And I don't believe, you know, I don't believe they're trying to deceive you or anything like that. But one little deception, one little change in the Word of God, when, <clears throat> when Jesus received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and God spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Well, when, when he went to the wilderness and Satan came to tempt him, Satan didn't say, he changed one word. He said, if you be the son of God. He didn't put in there, if you be the beloved son of God. Because God had just spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Satan changed just one word. And you can do that in the word of God and change one word and have a totally different meaning. So you have to be accurate in what you're studying and what comes through the Word of God. Not go by what I say, not go by what Cecil B. DeMille says, go by what this Word says because this Word is accurate. And it, there, there are many things in it that may seem inaccurate or may seem to be not quite kosher, let's say, from a Hebrew sense, but once you study out the word, it's accurate. It's very, very accurate. And the answers are in here. And if you have a question on a movie or anything like that, go to the word and see what the word says about it. Study the word. Study to show yourself approved. And see what the word says. You can, uh, you know, the, the, it says in Isaiah, that Jesus was of no comely virtue. In other words, he had no outward beauty that we would be drawn to him. He had an inward beauty. But when you see pictures of Jesus, blue eyes, kind of blonde, brownish hair, really handsome, good-looking guy, that's not the case. That's not the, what the Word says. The Word said that he had no outward beauty. Like, uh, like Saul, King Saul, it says in 1 Samuel 6, that he was the tallest and the best looking in Israel. And that's why God chose him to be the king to show the people of Israel, you want the best looking, the tallest, or do you want the best leader? And David ended up being one of the best leaders, not the greatest. But they were all there as to set the, set the stage for Jesus Christ coming. Everything in the scriptures are there 
to set the stage for him coming and doing what he did because he was there from the beginning, he's there at the end, and he's everywhere in between. Everything in the Bible is written about him and for him. And in Colossians it says, in him all things exist and consist, and all things were created by him and for him. And so everything in here is designed to point to Jesus Christ and his coming and to, and, and to emphasize what he was here for and what he did for us and what he gave us. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father, and it says in Romans 8, Jerry and I's favorite chapter, I think, in the, but we always end up there in Bible studies and stuff, but it says now all creation is groaning for the manifestation of the sons of God. Creation is groaning out for the manifestation of the sons of God, for us to step up to the plate and do what God called us to do. We have that in our arsenal. We have everything in our arsenal. Jesus Christ gave it to us at the cross. Now we need to have the knowledge, the understanding of how to use it. Now, when the, when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, they started murmuring and complaining, and you know every step along the way, everything they did, they complained about it. They did not enter the rest of God. God had this for them, and they did not enter into that rest. You can study that in Hebrews. In uh, <clears throat> Hebrews 4.1, it says, uh, let us fear that we don't enter into that rest. That's the only place in the Bible you'll find it to fear. The, in, the, in other words, the fear the, that is the fear kind, not the reverence of God. It's, it's to fear that you don't enter into the rest of God. Now, all the way through, as they're doing, as they're murmuring and complaining about all these things, the children of Israel, if you go to uh, Joshua chapter 2, now this is, this is when uh, they, they uh, the ten spies had gone in and, and uh, they were, you know, the two spies, Joshua and Caleb, hey, we're well able to take this land. We can, we can do it. And the ten spies, they said no. The giants in the land and everything else. Now, Rahab, in verse uh, 8, Rahab, the, the, the spies came and Rahab hid them. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land that the terror of, your, of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan. And see, when they went to enter the land before and the ten spies came back with a bad report, they wouldn't go into the promised land. But God had already prepared a way for them. Their, their hearts, the hearts of the giants in that land had already been defeated. They were already defeated. All Israel had to do was walk in and take the land. But they were too busy complaining and murmuring. And that's and an example. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that we would probably be the same way if we didn't have the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. You know, now we have the Holy Spirit, we have the Word of God, and we know what we have through Jesus Christ. Not everybody does. I mean, you have babes that still are drinking milk, and you have mature people. We want to be mature. We want to be, know what we are in Christ. That's the ultimate importance, to know who you are and what you are in Jesus Christ and what he did for you. And don't insult the Spirit of grace by not entering into that rest that he has for you. Come on, what time do I have to quit? 
past the buck. Ten after, okay. Uh, this was just a representation. Now, what we talked about last month, um, Genesis chapter 15, it went into this description. Uh, God spoke to Abraham and told him what was going to happen. The, the people, let's go back here and, and read it. Genesis uh, chapter 15. Now this was... We, this was our last month's study. We didn't get into it too much because I shared about my trip to Israel. But uh, if you go to, uh, how I was out in uh, Colorado a couple weeks ago, and, and uh, Dwayne Sheriff, he was uh, teaching, and uh, he started in. He says, well, let's go to verse 9. Now well, let's go back to it. Let's just start at Genesis 1, 1, and we'll begin there. And I, I loved it when he said that. Because you can always go back and start at the beginning. <clears throat> and incidentally, one thing I did learn, uh, what Jerry was talk, kind of talking about was uh, the counterfeit. Uh, the the uh, Secret Service, when they train their agents, they don't show them counterfeit bills. They only show them real bills. The genuine article. And uh, one of the things that we need to do is show the genuine article in Jesus Christ. And you'll know the counterfeit. When you see, if you're watching a movie or anything, and you see anything counterfeit, when you know the real Jesus Christ and what he did for you, you won't pay attention to it. You'll go, hey, that's not real. That's counterfeit. That's not my Jesus. That's not my Lord. So that that's something to keep to keep in mind. And, and in verse uh, 8, and he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? This is Abraham talking to God. So he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Then he brought all these to him, cut them in two down the middle, and placed them opposite sides each other, but he did not cut the birds in two. Now, you could uh, actually, well, if you go over to verse uh, 17, and it came to pass when they went down and it was dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. That's the Holy Spirit passing between those pieces. But that also speaks about the Red Sea party. Uh, there's, a, there's a connection there to, to uh, what God had been sharing with, with Abraham. And, and if you go back uh, to 13, and he said to Abraham, Know certainly that your descendants will be stri strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nations whom they serve I will judge. Afterward they shall come out with great possession. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the Egyptians gave them gold, silver, all jewels, precious jewels, all kinds of stuff just to get rid of them. I mean, they were ready for them to go. And then all of a sudden, Pharaoh's heart was hard, and he goes, hey, who's going to serve us now? And so he went after them. And uh, all of those jewels and the gold and everything is what God instructed them to use in the building of the temple. And he gave them earthly wisdom, the wisdom that's not from above, but it is from the Holy Spirit. But it's earthly wisdom on how to cut jewels. And to this day, the Jewish, the Jewish people are the best diamond cutters, gem cutters in the world. Uh, they, they're blessed in that respect because God showed them how to do it. He gave them wisdom that says in Numbers, you can read about that in Numbers, where they... He instructed them how to build the temple and how to cut stones and cut gems. And so that to this day, they have that in their arsenal. They can, they can use that, and they're the best in the world at it. And they're, they're 
they're a blessed people because God chose them. And we're blessed if we bless them. If we bless Israel, we're blessed. That's what the word tells you. You can bank on that. But uh, what we shared about this uh, just uh, carries on to what uh, Abraham, what God shared with Abraham here was what Moses was going to do when, when they crossed the Red Sea and they connected all these things together. And the Word of God is like that. It connects everything together, but it also connects Jesus Christ because it's all written about Him, for Him, and by Him. And He is the Word of God. He is the rhema Word of God. He is hearing. He is seeing. And you get that from Him. The more you, uh, the more you become like Him, or the more the Holy Spirit molds your thinking in here and then up here, first you have to get it here. You can have it up, a lot of people have it up here in their brain, but it's down here is where the revelation of God comes from. One of the things I learned when I was in Colorado was that uh, you have to be humble to receive revelation from God because you have to understand that God is smarter than we are. And he is a whole lot smarter than we are. And if we, it, it, one of my favorite uh, clips out of a movie, it was Tango and Cash. This was back in the early 90s. Kurt Russell and uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone, and they're detectives, and they're kind of against each other. But the bad guy sets them up to come to a warehouse, and he's going to set these guys up. So... They're coming from opposite ends, and they're sneaking through, and they run into each other at a corner, come around a corner, and they run into each other. And, and uh, Sylvester Sloan says, what are you doing here? I've been working on this case for three months. And Kurt Russell says, well, I've been on it for 30 minutes, and I'm all caught up. <laughs> well, you know, for you guys to listen to the Holy Spirit, and like I, I taught before, it isn't me that's teaching, it's the Holy Spirit that's teaching. As long as I'm obedient to the Holy Spirit, it's not coming out of my mind, it's coming out of the Holy Spirit. And if you'll allow that to take, to do the process that God wants to do in your lives, you, you can be all caught up in 30 minutes. You can, you can receive that revelation knowledge and be all caught up. And, and you're way far ahead of the game that way. So... I think we got, that's about it right there. So, Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word, it brings light to our lives, that it brings victory to our lives, Father. The word is sharper than any two-edged sword, even dividing asunder the soul and the spirit. And, Father, we thank you that our spirits are led by your Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. He leads us and guides us. And we thank you that we will receive a return, a hundredfold return on the seeds planted today from your word. We thank you for that. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we give you all the honor and the glory. All the honor and the glory goes to you, Father, and your Son, Jesus Christ, for what he did for us on the cross. We totally believe that, and we receive that into our lives, and we thank you for it. And we honor you, Father, in Jesus' name.